Got it. Welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark. Tonight, we have on a guest who, folks, uh, if you have been listening or watching Ask Lovecraft uh, for the last six years, I went back and found out, uh, you have heard his work. Uh, Evan Stevens, welcome to the show. Evan has been doing the music <laughs> for Ask Lovecraft. Uh, he did not, not specifically, he wrote this very wonderful Lovecraftian music and was very generous and allowed me to make use of it. Uh, but prior to that, uh, Evan had, had reached out about a couple of other different, uh, projects and what have you. And we had sort of been in exchange. Um, tell me, Evan, how did you, I guess, how did you find the show originally <laughs> and sort of so, what inspired you to reach out? I dated a, a college classmate of yours, Mary Thule. Yes. Okay. Yep. And there she when so she obviously heard me writing music all the time. And she's like, you know who you need to get in touch with and hooked me up with your information. And that's how it started. There we go. That is fantastic. Well, because for the longest time, I didn't have any music on the show. Obviously, my my intro was just a small child going, ah, it's Lovecraft. Um, and then it would just fade to black and there would be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I just didn't, I didn't, I was like, why would I have music? Like it, I, the uh, production values on this show have definitely <laughs> gone through some interesting <laughs> waves. Um, but what I did reach out to you about was the fact that I was doing audio narrations of Lovecraft stories. And I had recorded a, a handful that uh, my friend Leah was doing editing work for. And I was like, hey, you're doing this sort of audio stories. Like I know someone who's doing like music. Do you want to have some music in your stories? And that was our first real like collaboration. And I guess I'm interested to know sort of how you got into music, how you got into, you know, weird fiction horror and how you decided to like make, make, make those action figures kiss. <laughs> um, okay. The first one's easier. I've been doing music forever. Um, I came from like a long musical family. My grandmother was an opera singer. Her sister was a violinist. Their father was a violinist. I grew up around music nonstop. Um, my first real career was as a musician, like as a teenager, which is to date the only job I've ever had where I lost money year after year, right? <laughs> and uh, it's it's like, you know, no way to no way to make a living. So Eventually, you know, like I never stopped writing music ever, but then in my 20s is when I really discovered like Lovecraft and and the, all the the whole world universe of like weird fiction. And I just deep dove real hard, real, real hard. And I started from, I don't know, the early, early stuff, like uh, the gothic stuff, Melmouth the Wanderer, Poe, you know, all those that stuff and worked my way steadily up. And then as soon as I hit Lovecraft, it was like, I just stopped and read him only for a long time. And uh, so it seemed eventually I kind of wanted to kind of put pieces together. And, you know, because I heard things in my mind when I was reading the stories and I wanted to sort of kind of put it down. And my first attempts were awful, like really, really bad. And, uh, you know, I just worked it out slowly, slowly, piece by piece. And now it's, it's much, much easier to like, you know, figure things out as like on the fly. And the, the collection of music that you've done for the show, uh, is this stuff that you sort of like decided I'm going to just like take a month and just do a whole bunch of Lovecraft or were these like things that you had just done over multiple years that you started to put together? How did that specific kind of project? Because we've got, you know, we have, uh, uh, let's see, Op 73, number 2B, Charles Dexter Ward, number three, Innsmouth for Harp, you know, like it seems like yeah. this was all sort of part of, of one sort of project, but I wasn't sure if that's how they started. They came up, they came about kind of like in two different ways. Mostly, yes. I, I sort of like went into binge mode and like, I like hammered them out one by one by one by one by one until all of a sudden I was like, I have 35 of these. And then uh, I went back and then added a lot of like digital effects when my computer got better, like a few years later. And so those ones, only selected ones kind of got reworked, but, uh, but yeah. They were mostly one giant project. Well, I've definitely benefited from it because I've been able to go through and like have very specific kind of mood pieces to go with the episode or be like, oh, you know what? I sort of, I touched on Innsmith and this one so I can throw this one out. Cause I just, you know, I don't, I don't list the, the titles. That's only for sort of my enjoyment, but I always sort of, you know, 
want to link folks back and see if they can uh, they can discover the different music and and things like that. I'm also only ever using like 20 seconds at a time. So if you've you know have got really brilliant things that start up after like second 23 or so, I'm sadly those do not get uh, get discovered. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's been a delight and it's so much fun. Um, I know another project that um, I, th I think before even I was using it for for my show was when I very briefly did a kind of a version of this interview program uh, for the Arkham Horror Book Club. We were this was oh. a group of folks where we were doing all sorts of different things, book reviews, movie reviews, and I was going to be like the interview guy. Um, this was with a, a project that was done with some of the folks who were working uh, for uh, the Necronomic Convention out of Providence, uh, Mallory O'Meara, who's gone on to become like a fantastic author. Um, she was sort of the main producer on this. But but like, I, I, I again, I was going back to sort of, you know, piece together the timeline of stuff we'd worked on. And that was that was a project where I was like, hey, uh, can I like steal some of your music again for this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. OK. So Man. that was definitely that was the first time that I made use of it. And then when that whole project kind of went by the wayside, I was like, Maybe, maybe I'll just use this for my show now. <laughs> How did you get into this? I'm, I've never really known. Oh, sure. So I got into playing Lovecraft uh, on stage. Uh, my fr okay. uh, friend of mine uh, from when I was living and working in Toronto, uh, we worked at a bookstore together and he was a playwright and he had written a play about Lovecraft and his wife, uh, Sonia Green. And I had sort of, I, I didn't help him with it. I had, I had told him, Hey, did you know that Lovecraft was married? And that's just an interesting story. Like I just sort of told him about that kind of on a whim. Cause we were, we worked at a bookstore together and he began like researching her and got very interested in this relationship and wrote a short play about their marriage. And I was in the first iteration of that. And then he kind of expanded that into kind of like a full one act. And I came back and played Lovecraft. And that was the summer of 2000. 11 and the next year i was sort of trying to figure out like i wanted to do something i wanted to do something for youtube like kind of short videos i wasn't quite sure what and i had this character of lovecraft in my head that i'd done all this sort of you know work on and i'm a huge fan of the podcast my brother my brother and me which is a comedy advice show and so i was like i'm just going to smash these two things together and do this comedy advice show as hp lovecraft and that was 10 years ago <laughs> and amazing Okay. Um, over the years, you know, the best part about it is getting to meet artists and collaborate with artists and creators and musicians and all sorts of folks. So, you know, I talk about like the, the production values of the show going up. That's just as I got more exposed to people with lots of talent, I was sort of able to, to, to make use of that and glom onto that, uh, and take inspiration from that. Um, and the music is definitely a part of that. Like, I think it, like, you know, it, it, I, it took me a long time to get there, but once once I started making use of it, I realized, oh, hey, this is actually like making my show fun and different and not just like me staring into the camera. So I'm very, <laughs> I was very appreciative of that. And now as we're kind of, you know, the, the show is not, it's weird, right? It's not like, oh, Lovecraft is going away forever, but it's the regular production is ending and anything that comes after this will be sort of special episodes and live okay. shows and things like that. Um, but I sort of wanted to reach out to folks who had been a part of this show and you have literally been in every episode for six years now. Yeah. And that's fantastic. It's amazing to me too. Like, <laughs> oh my God. And sometimes like recently, my sister found you independently and then like saw my credit, like in your little, in the, like the byline or whatever. And she was like, what? <laughs> like what? <laughs> So I had to have like an hour long talk with my sister about like <laughs> how that happened. And so it's really cool. Yeah. Well, I think I'm glad I finally got the right link on for the long time. I think I had like a defunct SoundCloud page that I was sending everyone to. <laughs> so, oh, luckily, no. <laughs> so luckily yeah. I got everything worked out and realized, okay, like it's still like, be sure to check your, your links. You may think they're still working folks, but <laughs> if you're, if you're just copy and pasting stuff for a while, you want to make sure that everything is, uh, uh, au courant. Um, and I know that, I mean, this, you know, you obviously did the, the Lovecraft work, but you've done sort of other authors and other kind of genres and whatnot. What are, what are some of the other examples of that that you've been playing with? Oh man. So lately, the most recent one I've been doing is MR James, who's like a, a real old love of mine. And uh, his stories lend themselves so well to like atmosphere. So like I've been, you know, toying with those. 
And the other author who really, the same way I feel like very strongly about like adding music to it, Robert Aikman. Yes. Oh, he's incredible. And so, but it's, it's very difficult because like, I mean, the moods of those stories are so hard to pin down and they end so abruptly. And I'm never, ever sure what the hell they mean anyway. Now, so, as you're writing this music, are you sort of like thinking of like music to listen as you read? Or is it really just sort of like, like, you know, stuff to evoke the same feeling as these stories? Both, both of okay. those. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, sometimes I even try to like, you know, I draw in like characters in, in the, you know, the violin is this or whatever. And, but that, that's not too common. Usually it's more like atmosphere, mood laying type stuff. And do you like, do you have sort of direct musical influences? Like, are you going back to, you know, listening to like the score for From Beyond and things like that? Or yes, are you, are yeah, you... sometimes I do. <laughs> uh, the things that I would definitely like quote direct, I mean, I couldn't, I have to cite to, like would be uh, Ennio Morricone's score for The Thing, 1982. Huge, I mean, I have ripped that off and uh, shamelessly. And the other one is David Lynch's movies have a ton of amazing sure. sound yeah straight out of nightmares so like it's i you know try to copy what i hear and then you know mess with it and smear it around but it's it's crazy i don't know what the hell he's doing half the time but yeah now i can now i came into horror f from literally the blockbuster like vhs section like that like i was a movie horror guy long before i was like reading horror are you like for you, was it similar or did like, were you like ingesting this stuff in all forms from the get-go? Yeah, kind of all forms. Um, growing up, I was like, you know, there's a lot of like uh, the old movies playing in my like household. So like a lot of the thirties universal stuff. And my dad was a real big, my dad was one of those dads that had real poor idea of like children are different from adults. So me and my sister were like constantly being showered with 80s gore like the blob and like all kinds of really you know like crazy killer clowns from outer space he rented once and we saw that <laughs> when we were like six and nine you know like so i don't know what my dad was thinking but like we saw it all and so like we got desensitized pretty quick and then then i began reading as a teenager like horror is sort of like the beginnings of it and then in my 20s they all really came together big time uh so i know exactly what your dad was thinking because uh yesterday <laughs> Uh, -oh. uh yesterday uh i i have sunday is when daddy gets to pick what was what we're gonna watch okay uh you know it's 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 daddy movie day and so far it's been very successful like it's a chance for me to like introduce weird stuff to my kids that's not like and they can't like because i've established here's the rule i'm gonna watch something you're invited to like watch with me like it's not like I'm making you watch this thing. So like, I like I introduced them to Dark Crystal, which like my daughter was like, eh, she was okay with my son, like, like is like obsessed with now. And like, only it's amazing. Watch. he's yeah. four and he just wants to watch Dark Crystal. Um, I, I introduced him to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And like, they're like, this is weird, but like, we kind of like this, you know, because with kids, like if you said, if you're sort of like, hey, I want you to see this thing, then they're gonna be like, no, I didn't discover it. I don't, I have no interest in it. It's sort of like a cat. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm that's why I'm phrasing this is like I will be watching something and you are allowed to like you can go read a book or do a puzzle or you can join daddy in this strange what have you and like there's some like I tried the whiz and I forgot how like I forgot how slow and long the opening <laughs> of the whiz is like the whole like family like dinner sequence just like like I'm like where's the giant where's the giant toilet like where's ease on down the road like no, like none of this is happening <laughs> At a, at a pace yeah. that like I can withstand, let alone like my four-year-old. But so like, so I, I mean, again, it's bonker stuff. I had them watch Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and they like sat through it. They're like, we have no idea what's going on, but That's like amazing. there's fun costumes. So I don't know, like it, it made it work, but I had my ultimate fail yesterday. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> because I'm like, all right, like what's something different? Like what's something like they haven't really tried before. I'm going to show them the Vincent Price house on haunted hill oh my god it's <laughs> like like my, i have vague memories of this and i remember being kind of like campy but yeah you know, it's not the one where the skeleton chases the woman into the acid bath right uh it, that, that we didn't get that far we got about half an hour in we got okay. to like we got the, like the ghost that like 
has you know like the the sort of the the long-haired ghost with the the giant scream uh the severed head in the box yeah <laughs> uh and just and 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 it's you they couldn't do with it well sorry my four-year-old was fine my four-year-old was like was was great with it especially when he realized how much it freaked his sister out and now it, like he's just like let's watch that again i'm like okay we're not just <laughs> we're not just gonna try to but like my daughter couldn't sleep last night i was supposed to play dungeons and dragons and mike like instead was up in her room like until like 10 o'clock consoling yeah. her and explaining to her that like ghosts were not going to come uh tonight she was starting to like get worried about it again so i gave her a plastic fork it was like this fork keeps ghosts away and she seems to have bought it um so <laughs> anyway that's what your dad was thinking it's just like i'm bored and i want to watch something <laughs> these kids are fine and like I was a weird horror kid. Like yeah, I, I remember same. going to the library and they had those big, I think they were orange books. And like, they just like describe some universal or classic horror movie, like with like stills from it and like kind of brief explanations of the plot. And like, I would take those home and be like, oh, the blob. Oh, you know, like, you know, Frankenstein. Uh, I don't think they had killer clowns at that point. Um, yeah. But like, that's how I learned about all this stuff because I wasn't watching it. Uh, although then, of course, my parents were letting me watch things like Name of the Rose and Fantastic Planet and yes. the Oblong Box. Like I watched the Oblong Box as like a nine year old. And like, that's not good. That's not good <laughs> for your brain. <laughs> that's then, amazing. I, and then I wound up being that the, the horror guy when I worked at Blockbuster. So, oh, my but God. Like, but like cinematic horror and like literary horror, like they are very different beasts, although like. They, inf they inform each other in weird ways. Um, and like the music that you provided, like like it, there is a cinematic quality to it, but like, I don't know, like the reason why it works so, so well and I really enjoy it is it's just evocative of very specific like moods and modes. And like, have you learned every single one of these instruments specifically to sort of capture <laughs> <laughs> the, that like the particular <laughs> tone you're going for you like i just mm, i need a little bit more theremin in my life so i'm gonna like start picking that up like, i've always wanted a theremin of all <laughs> ah, they're so expensive they're like hundreds of dollars i'm sure <laughs> oh my god no no the answer to that is funny like i grew up playing the piano and then i was forced into the violin but i abandoned it real quick for the guitar and uh i didn't like the whole universe of like orchestral stuff i found through you know like software right and uh, in 2008, like somebody gave me like a pirated copy of Finale, like the score writing program. And I was I was blown away. You could just like drag a note up and down and listen to an oboe go crazy. And like I had no idea what the limits of any of the instruments were. Like I was trying to write all these things that were impossible to play. And <laughs> oh, man. So, no, no. The answer was it, it came to me very slowly. And like even now I'm, I have to like remind myself, I'm like, Whoop. English horn. What the hell is that again? And like, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. So I'm what I, I usually like, I'm, I'm looking for like a, a specific sound and I have to like kind of hunt around for which exact instrument provides it. And then I have to re-familiarize myself with the limits of that instrument and how loud and soft it can get and all that stuff. Well, it's very cool. And it's very enjoyable. Um, have you, have you tried to like ever sort of knit everything together and create sort of like a, you know, either a, a full operetta or like kind of narrative musical piece, a rock opera. <laughs> Only for like purely classical music. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those I've done like piano concertos and tone poems and stuff like that, but I've never tried one with like with this kind of like a narrative underpinning. I just, I just saw a musical here recently and it was interesting because like the music was very good and like, the play was very good, but it was like, there was some interesting kind of disconnect. Like, does this like music actually carrying the story forward or is it just, we're having a nice moment now, like <laughs> listening to a song. <laughs> Cause I grew up with musicals, right? Like, you know, I used okay. to dance, I used to dance around the house to, you know, master of the house and Les Mis and, you know, man of La Mancha and, and all that stuff. Um, but like the only time I ever like listened to, you know, quote unquote classical music or, you know, just non not people singing uh were road trips when my dad would pull out i think he had like a cassette tape that was like the opera goes to the movies so it was whenever like people like you know scenes in movies where someone goes to like you know list like la triviata or something like that that's um, amazing or various other like you know classical scores that were part of film <laughs> so even yeah. then it wasn't like taken out of the context um 
that was that was how it was, I knew like art music. I, I had a I had a friend in grad school who very quickly like would like wrap me over the hands if I ever referred to like classical music as you know the generic terms. Like it's not classical because it could be baroque. You don't know it's art music. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And so yeah, this has been um, it's been interesting to see the ways that lots of different. I don't know, like lots of different forms of art intersect with Lovecraft himself, right? Because like Lovecraft is a is a strange little man <laughs> and has become this sort of, you know, brand ambassador of horror for good or for ill. The McDonald's, yeah. the McDonald's arches of <laughs> of horror. Yeah, but it does like it like it brings so many different forms and genres and what about the disciplines right like you know yeah. to whether you're you know the writers the filmmakers puppeteers <laughs> uh graphic designers uh it's so it's been for me i'm always very interested in that kind of like the intersection of you know someone who, who comes from a very specific discipline whether it's you with music me with acting someone else who's who's a writer but when we all sort of meet in the weird like nuclear vortex of lovecraft and that sort of weird fiction like what What's brought us all here? Because for me, it was very much like I was, I did not grow up a Lovecraft person. Like I, I, you know, you said you found him in your twenties. I don't think I was reading him until like my late, late twenties, you know, like yeah. I, and it wasn't until I was playing him, literally just putting on his flesh mask and pretending to be <laughs> him uh, that, that I sort of got into this world. And so dropping in very late into this sort of fan community um, and, and sort of approaching from the kind of like the servants, you know, door <laughs> is, it's been it's been different. Um, you know, do you consider yourself part of that kind of that larger fanish community, or do you sort of like enjoy it aesthetically, but without like you know going to the cons and all that sort of scene? I well, I haven't. There are cons for I didn't even know that, but um, I would go. I would totally go. I would <laughs> consider myself like a big Lovecraft fan. My my shelf over here has like you know all the stuff like the official biography and the annotated versions and. The, the the Japanese manga versions of Mountains of Madness and you know you <laughs> name it I love all of it and then when, when like years ago when I first started writing this stuff I had a friend that I you know like I would run it by and he's like you know you have no idea what's out there he's like go on Etsy and just type in Lovecraft and I was like I was like candles and sculptures and I was blown away like you're right like it's a fascinating weird intersection of interests that people it's just like just really attach themselves to. I had a I had a document open for a while of Kickstarter, Lovecraft related uh -huh. Kickstarter to look at like the value <laughs> to see like how many of the things had been like successfully funded, like and how much it had been funded for. And it was bonkers. I mean, and because it's a lot of times it's these large scale things like board games, which always go crazy uh, yeah. or video games, but also like comic books and and anthologies. Um, it's. Yeah, it's it's an industry. I mean, there's a reason I call, you know, I talk about the McDonald Arches because like it is, you know, the sort of the Lovecraft industrial complex. You know, you say, are there, <laughs> are there, uh, you know, are there Lovecraft conventions? There are at least two regular ones and I'm sure there's others. There's, you know, Necron wow. there's the Necronomic Convention uh, out in Providence. That's kind of the big, you know, uh, tent pole one. Uh, that's kind of, oh. that, that used to be there and then it sort of was away for a while and now it's back and it's, you know, kind of the a big, what I would consider like a multidisciplinary full fandom. We're doing movies and we're doing book signings and we're wow. doing music and like talks and panels. Uh, there's also the HP Lovecraft Film Festival and there's different versions of that, but the main one is out in Portland uh, and oh. I've been out to that. That's fantastic. The same folks who do that also have done Cthulhu Con, <laughs> okay, uh, which is like a sort of a smaller, more intimate uh, version. But yeah, like there is like a, you know, it's a it's a scene, right? Like yeah. it is a full on scene. Like you could you could spend a lot of money just like finding all the various little places and conventions um, where where like yeah, there it's you know, even if they're not fully dedicated to Lovecraft, I and mean, there's you know again there's the one that literally put his name on everything. Um, but like I've been invited out and they've gotten to perform places because folks want to have a random Lovecraft, you know, at their convention and I'll go there yeah. and I won't be the only Lovecraft related person, right? Like there'll be enough of us to be like a panel, you know? And so it's, yeah, it is, it is the, the weird tide pools of fandom are so sort of strange and out there um, and have existed for such a long time. I mean, that's the other thing, right? Like the fact that so many of these, you know, conventions have been going for decades, um, 
And I mean, you know, I don't know if you follow the sort of the huge flap that went over with the World Fantasy Awards that used the bust that was Lovecraft's head. You know, that was born out of the fact that like the original version of this, you know, award was like folks who knew Lovecraft, you know, it was like that kind of that generation after him. So like, yes. yeah, it has been it has been going on for a very long time um, and draws folks from from all over. Right. And I think that's yeah. that's that's fascinating and that's exciting. Uh, but also you sort of like, oh, like I've I've <laughs> lifted up this rock un, sort of unaware of what I was going to find <laughs> underneath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's not a lot. I mean, but for all of that, there are not a ton of what I would consider Lovecraft musicians out there. You know, I think there's there's a couple. Of I haven't encountered many either. There's, yeah. you know, Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, Torin uh, Atkinson, who um, uh, I think there's, you know, Jen and Miskatonic, I think was another band <laughs> that was out for a while. Uh, and then, of course, there's just all the influence and kind of heavy metal, right? You know. Yes. Oh, my God. And that's a whole other genre. Can you like, was that was that ever something that you kind of like <laughs> fell into that world or? So my my best friend growing up, his dad was a huge Metallica fan and like Call of Cthulhu and it took me years to connect those, you know, like I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's the same thing. But uh, no, I never really like, I grew up around a lot of metal heads. Like I grew up in a really small semi-rural town in Maryland, central Maryland. And it was, it was either you were into super country or super metal. And like, that was <laughs> and, like, I was the weird new wave kid, right? Like, <laughs> but uh, no, like it's, there's so you're right. There's so much, especially now, more than ever now. And it's, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, the misfits have like the 10,000 eyes and there's a million songs with like horrible, especially the, you know, the Nordic stuff, the Scandinavian in general, but um, not so much. I, I played metal, you know, as, as a youth or whatever, but I kind of grew out of it and I never really, for some reason that that's I've like remained on the outside for me, like for whatever reason, I enjoy it from time to time, but I don't like express myself through it. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Why we all of us yeah. go on our fun, random journeys. I certainly never like, you know, thought I was going to wind up impersonating <laughs> 1920s horror writers uh, yeah. as a young, as a young <laughs> actor. <laughs> that was not quite what uh, I thought was ahead of me, but 10 years later, here we are. And yeah, it's been, um, it's been a journey and I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really honored that you shared this with me and you allowed me to, you know, sort of make use and play with your, your sounds and, and have them really give the show a texture and a quality that, uh, it was lacking for the first few years. <laughs> it's really my pleasure. Um, if folks are sort of interested in what you've got going on and, and other projects and stuff like that, where's the best place they can go to, to find your work? Well, I'm still on SoundCloud. I finally got around to like uploading everything to like the, the bigger music brokerages like Spotify and stuff. It's funny. I was just looking like in all the time I've been on Spotify, I've made like $8 and 49 cents. <laughs> they don't even out. let you cash out until you get like 20 bucks. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm generally searchable at that point. Fantastic. Well, Evan, this has been an absolute pleasure and an absolute delight. Thank you so much for coming on the show, talking about your journey talking about Lovecraft and uh, yeah. And again, thank you so much for uh, helping me sign off my show in style and class. Thank you very much. It's really been my pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. This has been Ask Lovecraft After Dark. Folks can find out more about this show. If you go to asklovecraft.com, you can find out more about me and my various projects over at lehmankessler.com. Or if you want to see me just shouting at the internet in general, you can follow me on Twitter at Lehman Kessler. This has been a, such a delight. Thank you, Evan, so much for being on. Thank you so much.